with Solutions at Neo4j, uh, and together with me today I have Will Lyon from the DevRel team. Uh, I'm going to start off this webinar with a high-level description of how you can work with graphs when building recommendation tools for your retail apps, and Will is going to follow that up with some Neo4j and Cypher demonstrations around recommendation engines later on. Uh, first of all, though, just to give you a 20-second intro to what we mean when we're referring to graphs. Uh, when we talk about graphs in this presentation, we're essentially talking about uh, a way of representing and storing data. So in this picture, for instance, we have data represented as rows and columns, as data would be stored in a relational database. While this data is modeled as a graph, which essentially means data that is connected through data relationships. And this is how data is represented when you're using a graph database such as Neo4j. So today we're going to talk about graphs and recommendation engines. And just to set the stage, uh, powerful real-time recommendations and personalization engines have become fundamental for creating superior user experience and commercial success in retail. And the reason why recommendations are so important is because in a digital world, users have an ocean of possibilities and choices. For example, how would you create relevance in a library of 20,000 movies or a personalized experience in a music app with over 10 million songs? Or in the case of retail, recommend the right product to a user when your inventory consists of 250,000 products and configurations. And this reality has become a very challenging task from a data processing perspective, especially if you're relying entirely on legacy technology infrastructure. And today we see graph-based recommendations. Uh, today we see that the graph-based recommendations really have transformed the consumer web. Uh, social networks rely on the people you may know recommendations. And the data network effects of this type of graph is also what's disrupting the world of media advertising business right now. Connecting people with products, the other people bought recommendation, has fundamentally transformed online retail where, of course, Amazon is the major disruptor. And content recommendation now lies at the core of user experience in the world of media, for example, streaming and movies and music. And today we also see that recommendations are becoming the core of digitization in retail. Uh, for example, effective product recommendation algorithms has become the new standard in uh, online retail, directly affecting revenue streams and shopping experience. Building powerful personal, personalized promotion engines is another area within retail that requires input from multiple data sources and real-time session-based queries which is an ideal task to solve with Neo4j. And routing recommendations allow companies to save money on routing delivery, providing better and faster service. So recommendations in all of these areas of retail are ideal to solve with a native graph database like Neo4j, because powerful recommendations truly lies on the connections between multiple sources of data. And that's what this uh, webinar is going to be all about. So let's look at some Neo4j in action and how to build recommendation engines for retail using a graph database. Uh, first, however, let's begin with asking ourselves this. What are some of the major challenges from a data point of view in retail today? Uh, well, the first ma major data generating challenge is, is that retail truly have become multi-channel. You have your email commerce apps your traditional brick and mortar, as well as your e-commerce websites. And especially on, online retail business rely heavily on effective product recommendations. And the challenge here, and this is where many traditional retailers fall short, is that they don't really have effective recommendation systems in place. That is, they don't really, really, really treat the online experience as the algorithm-driven business it is, which means that different users get the same identical product recommendations. But users 
and their preferences differ very much. Uh, not only do, do users differ from, from other users, users require different recommendation based on real-time behavior. And adding to this complexity, for a large retailer, we can be talking about millions of offline and online transactions on a daily basis. So the task for the developer, CTO, or the line of business manager is to make sure that promotions and product recommendations are as relevant as possible and that they are served in real time. So now, if we look at what's happening under the hood of a recommendation engine, there are two dominating algorithms in play. The first is based on what is called collaborative filtering which is an algorithm that considers users' interactions with products with the assumption that other users will behave in, in similar ways. The other algorithm is content-based and is an algorithm that considers similarities between products and categories of products. And if we were to data model uh, what fits into these algorithms expressed as graphs, it would look something like this. That is, customers who have bought different products and products that belong to categories and subcategories. And Will is going to explain this more in depth in a few minutes during the hands-on Neo4j demonstration. But before we get into that, uh, I want to talk uh, about another major challenge from a data point of view in retail, and that is leveraging data stored in disparate silos, which is also referred to as polyglot persistence. If we consider our recommendation data sources, we have products and customers or users. Uh, and uh, products can mean many things uh, because products exist in an inventory. Uh, products have locations in terms of stores uh, and uh, different um, uh, storage hubs. Uh, products that belong to different categories, such as it could be uh, like bedroom or uh, a home office or a living room if we're talking about furniture, for example. Uh, products have, of course, different price prices and different types of configurations in terms of designers, um, uh, colors, uh, sizes, and so on. Uh, customers behave in the same way that the user behavior is stored in, in, in all kinds of different ways. And if you consider all, all the ways a customer or user can, can interact with a uh, web application, for example, a customer can make a purchase, it can return goods, it can review goods, it can view goods, uh, you can have an in-store purchase, uh, and customers also have different locations. And all of these behaviors and um, configurations of customers, users, and products uh, results in data that needs to be stored in different types of uh, uh, in, in different types of databases and storage, and this results the result of this is that basically every major retailer today have to rely on many different types of data stores that exist within the architectures to perform very specific tasks. So, for example, your product catalog would most likely be stored in some sort of document store whereas the records of a customer purchase, for example, uh, most likely would end up in a relational database, and an in-store offline purchase is probably stored in a completely different relational database, and customer reviews of products would be recorded in a completely different space, and so on. And the problem here is not that data exist in different silos. It's actually, it actually needs to be that way. Uh, however, the challenge when building recommendations is to be able to extract value from this, this data across these silos. And of course, most companies are aware of this, and many of them turn to the promise of a data lake for deriving value across silos, basically pouring all of the data into this type of repository. Uh, but where many enterprises are struggling is, while data lakes are great for analytics, business intelligence, and MapReduce, it is not appropriate to serve up to your customers in real time because it's essentially a non-operational workload and the queries are too slow to run in real time. Recommendations, on the other hand, require an operational workload 
it's in the moment and it has to be real time. So this is how we would solve the silo problem with Neo4j. Uh, one of the key strengths with Neo4j is our ability to connect and extract data from all different types of data sources. So how does this work? Well, First of all, you will extract the data needed for your recommendations into Neo4j. Uh, and we're not talking about all the data, but the data your recommendation model requires. And once you got this stored and connected in Neo4j, you will be able to run queries across these silos in a way that is virtually impossible for, uh, for other database management systems. Uh, and because of its Neo4j's index-free adjacency, Neo4j is able to query across these data sets in, in real time very efficiently. And the results of these queries will then be able to provide your applications and services with powerful recommendations. So that's it for the high level intro to some of the high level challenges that exist within retail today. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Will Lyon now, who will go over how this works a bit more in detail. So over to you, Will. Great. Thanks, Alessandro. Uh, so yeah, as Alessandro said, I'm going to go through just a little demonstration uh, in Neo4j, how we might import some data from different data sources relevant for retail recommendations, and show how we can write some queries in Neo4j uh, to generate personalized recommendations by querying across these, these data sets using Cypher, which is the query language for Neo4j, sort of SQL for graphs, uh, essentially. So this, uh, this application that I have open, this is Neo4j Browser. Uh, Neo4j Browser is a query workbench for running queries against Neo4j, uh, visualizing and working with the results. So I have an empty uh, instance of Neo4j running locally uh, that this Neo4j browser is, is connected to. And I'm going to bring up uh, just sort of some, some embedded queries here to walk through our demo. So as Alessandro pointed out, one of the, the benefits of, of Neo4j is being able to work with data from lots of different silos or, or different sources. And because of the flexibility of the graph data model to be able to integrate these, uh, these data sets and, and query across them uh, in the graph. So the first uh, sort of silo that we're going to start with is what we'll call the product silo. So this is essentially our product catalog. Um, so I, I have MySQL, our relational database running somewhere. Here it is. Uh, so you know, a, a typical architecture may be we have our product catalog information in a relational database. Um, in this case, I have a single table here in, in MySQL. Uh, this is a product catalog for a, a fictional uh, furniture store. And so I have uh, some products here. Every product has a, a SKU, some description, a price, category, parent category, and designer. So pretty, uh, pretty simplified product catalog uh, sitting in MySQL. And so the first thing I want to do is pull this into Neo4j and, and model this as a graph. How can I do that? Uh, well, we can, use, uh, we can use JDBC to connect to relational databases and pull this data directly uh, into Neo4j using Cypher. So this is uh, an example of a, a Cypher query. Let's, um, let's simplify this a little bit. We'll drop, drop all this piece and just return row here. So what are we doing? So uh, we're connecting to MySQL running locally, uh, accessing the furniture store database, and running a SQL statement. So select star from products. What is this going to do? This is going to essentially stream each row from that products table uh, into Neo4j, and we're just going to return each row as it comes in initially. So we're not creating any data here. We're just making sure we can connect, uh, connect to MySQL and, and sort of see what data we're getting back. And you can see we get back each row in this map or dictionary. Uh, OK, so that's great. Uh, if we want to model this as a graph and, and store this in Neo4j, 
so we can do that here with a series of merge statements. So if you've never seen Cypher before, uh, the most important thing as you're looking at Cypher is to realize that Cypher is all about uh, defining graph patterns. So we define nodes within uh, parentheses. So here we're defining uh, some category node and setting a name property on this node. And we do that um, also for the parent category. And then we create a relationship uh, for this product from its, its category to its parent category. Then we do that for the product and, and so on. So let's go ahead and run this. When we run this statement, it's created uh, our product catalog in Neo4j now so we can see some of the products we have, like this hammock uh, that's in, uh, or sorry, hammock is a, a category, rather. Um, so we can see uh, here's this rocking hammock uh, product that's in the category hammock, uh, which is a subcategory of, uh, of patio. Um, we can see uh, here are some, uh, some more outdoor furniture. We can see the designer uh, of this particular product and, and so on. So this is how we might model our product catalog uh, as a graph. We can inspect the schema or the meta model. Essentially what we have are product nodes uh, that are connected to some uh, designer who designed the product. And then products are in a category. And this category node may be a subcategory of another category, uh, such as how we, we had with hammocks uh, were a subcategory of patio furniture. So this is, uh, this is our initial data model for our product catalog. Let's, uh, let's see what sort of recommendations we can do in Neo4j just with this product uh, silo information. So this query, this is going to grab uh, just some product. It would do a lookup by SKU. Uh, and then traverse out from that product to see what category it's in. So if we look at this, uh, we can see, okay, here's, uh, here's an oak writing desk that's in the category desks. Um, and we can traverse out by double clicking to see you know, what other products are in this, uh, this category. What's the parent category? We can traverse out from the parent category and, and so on. Uh, so in this case, we're uh, we're interested in this oak writing desk. So let's say that the user is on our web application looking at this oak writing desk. What sort of recommendations might we want to show them? Well, uh, an easy recommendation using our product silo information is similar products. So based on overlapping categories or, or other traits of the product, what are products that are similar that we can recommend to this user that they might be interested in because they're looking at, uh, at this desk. Well, here's a, a super simple query to do that. We start at, uh, start at the product that they're looking at, then we traverse out to the category node uh, that this product belongs to, then from that category node, traverse out to other products that are in the same category. So this is, this is a simple example. But we can see we end up with the height adjustable standing desk and this walnut roll top desk. So these are two items we might show the user uh, that are similar to the product they're looking at now. And of course, we can uh, be a little bit more complex in our, our graph traversal patterns. So now we're not only going to look for overlapping category, we're going to look for uh, overlapping designer. And we can see here uh, now the oak writing desk and, and the walnut roll top desk both share uh, category and designer, so we can say that they're, uh, they're a bit more similar, uh, more relevant recommendations. Now we can also take advantage of this hierarchy of product categories uh, that we have here. So what is this doing? Well, this is taking advantage of the variable length path operator. Uh, in Cypher. So we're going to traverse from uh, this product to its category and then to the parent category and down to other products. So we're essentially going to see 
similar uh, products, but not just within uh, the desk category. We're also going to traverse out to this home office category and down to uh, bookcases, office chairs, desk lights, and, and so on. And these are products that we might recommend to the user based on uh, them looking at this oak writing desk. And this gets at the idea that some products may be uh, complements. So if you're, if you're looking at a desk, you may need a desk light, an office chair uh, to go with that, uh, rather than just another desk. Uh, and of course, we can also write this query so that, uh, hey, if we know the user has purchased a desk, don't recommend other desks to them. Instead, recommend products that are complements. Uh, but of course, to do that kind of recommendation, we need to bring in uh, more information uh, specific to our user. Uh, so we have, uh, in this case, this is just uh, a Google spreadsheet here with our customer information. So this is uh, this sheet here. We have uh, customers have a name. They have some, uh, some city that they live in and some uh, unique ID associated with them. So a pretty simple model. Uh, now, with uh, Cypher, we have the ability to, uh, to load data in CSV format. Uh, so we saw previously how we were using JDBC to pull data in from, uh, from MySQL, and now we're pulling in just from a, from a flat file. Uh, in this case, it's in a, a Google spreadsheet at this URL. We can also you know, load this file uh, locally or, or so on. Uh, and now this, this query is pretty simple. For each row in this CSV file, uh, create a customer node, set their name, and then create a node for uh, the city that they live in and represent this uh, with the relationship. So here's, uh, here's sort of what we've, what we've created. We have uh, some users. They live in a handful of different cities. And the next thing we want to do is import uh, orders. So our, our customers. Uh, place orders. Those orders uh, have products that are in them. Here we can see in this tab what this looks like. Uh, so customers uh, orders SKUs to connect them to the products. And so if we run this, we're going to import some, and again, this is just uh, fictitious information uh, for a, uh, a furniture store. And now we can see what, what this information looks like. So here's, uh, here's some customer, Kathleen. She placed uh, an order, order 26. Order 26 was uh, one product, this mid-century side chair. But we have other orders that may have had multiple products uh, and so on. So now if we inspect our, uh, our schema or our meta, meta model, we can now see that instead of just products that are in a category that are designed by some designer, we now have uh, orders that contain the product that were placed by a specific customer, and, and that customer lives in uh, a certain city. So essentially, we have now two sort of data silos that we've integrated, uh, our product silo and our uh, customer and, and transaction silo. Uh, so data from different systems that we've integrated into, uh, into the graph. Let's see how we might uh, now query across these to generate uh, a recommendation using the collaborative filtering approach. So as Alessandro pointed out earlier, collaborative filtering is this idea uh, of looking at customers' interactions with products. So either you've, you've purchased a product, you've viewed a product, uh, you've reviewed it, something like that, using that information uh, to find uh, other products you may be interested in uh, based on not only your interactions with, with the product catalog, but also the interactions of all of the other users. So let's pick some, uh, some customer here, Nicole Ramsey, and let's traverse out from Nicole to uh, the orders that she's placed to the products that are contained in those orders. And then let's see uh, 
essentially other customers who have bought those same products, right? We, we traverse out from those products that Nicole has purchased to other orders to find customers who have bought the same products as Nicole. And then we traverse out from those uh, other customers to find what orders they've placed uh, and what products are in those orders. So this is essentially saying uh, who's buying the same things uh, as Nicole, what else are they buying uh, that Nicole might be interested in? And we end up here with, uh, with three recommendations, uh, a walnut bookcase, a, a side chair, and a desk chair. And we see a score associated with these, each one of these. And in this, this simple version of collaborative filtering, uh, this is just the number of paths that we found. So uh, essentially how many other users have purchased uh, this item that gives us some score of how relevant of a recommendation that might be for Nicole. Okay, so that's that's simple collaborative uh, filtering, but we have uh, we have some more information to incorporate in the graph here. Uh, how about uh, product reviews? So we may have uh, product review information in maybe a document database. Uh, something like that, um, and we can work with we can work with that in Neo4j as well. So here's uh, a JSON document, the type of thing we might see in, in Mongo or, or, or Couchbase. Um, we can import this now into Neo4j uh, using the APOC library. Um, APOC is a, a library of uh, procedures. For J, this is what we used earlier to connect to MySQL uh, with JDBC. Anyway, this allows us to, uh, to load this JSON file, and then now we are uh, looking up customers and products, and we are setting, uh, creating rather, this reviewed relationship where we've seen that uh, customers have reviewed some product, they've given a rating, uh, we're now adding this information. Uh, into the graph as well. And so now we can see here uh, that Kathleen uh, reviewed this walnut bookcase. And if we look at this reviewed relationship, we can see there's a rating property. So she rated it, uh, rated it a four here. So how can we use this information uh, to improve that collaborative filtering uh, recommendation we were doing earlier. Well, now let's look at um, products that Nicole has reviewed. Who else has reviewed them? Uh, and then what other uh, products have those customers reviewed? And we want to filter now where we have relatively high or relatively positive ratings. I only return products. Uh, that have been reviewed positively. And we can see now we've filtered out um, one of the items that we recommended previously. So if we look at what we recommended previously, we had three. Now we only have the, the walnut bookcase and the leather desk chair. So these are more relevant recommendations uh, for Nicole because now we're taking some rating information uh, into account. Great, and the, the final sort of silo that, uh, that I want to take a look at here is our inventory information. So we talked about this idea that um, we have both uh, an online presence for our store, so we can uh, place orders online, but particularly with a, with a furniture store, we may be buying a, a large item that's prohibitively expensive to ship, or uh, we want something right away, so we want to be able to go to our local store uh, to pick this up. So we may want to uh, add in information about the items that we have in inventory uh, in uh, certain stores that are in certain cities, certain locations. Um, so this may be stored in, uh, in a completely different system from our product catalog or our transactions or user reviews. And again, we're representing uh, this other system just with another uh, another Google Sheet. Um, this is what, what it looks like. We just have the store, uh, the SKU, and then the, the number of items that we have in stock um, at that store. And so we just add this information to the graph. Now if we 
uh, let's look at, look at our meta model now. So we can see that we now have uh, stores that are in, uh, in a city that have this inventory relationship with the product. And on the inventory uh, relationship, we've set a property that's the number of items that we have uh, in stock at that store. So here we can see for this uh, Walnut Standard bookcase, uh, we have four items uh, in the Missoula store. So finally, let's see how we can improve our recommendation query, uh, recommending furniture items to Nicole. So we saw previously we were looking at the reviewed relationships. We were filtering only on uh, positive reviews, but now we want to make sure that that item that we're recommending uh, is in stock for Nicole in the, the city that she lives in. So once we generate the recommendation, we then traverse out along this inventory relationship to, uh, to the stores that this, uh, this product uh, is in inventory in. And we then make sure that that store is in the same city that Nicole lives in and filter only where we have some positive number uh, of those products in stock. And now if we run this, uh, we can see that now the most relevant recommendation for Nicole is this Walnut Standard Bookcase. Um, it's in stock in the store in the city that she lives in. Uh, there's some overlap with our collaborative filtering algorithm that, that shows that uh, it has positive reviews from users who have reviewed similar items to Nicole. This is, uh, this is our most relevant recommendation uh, for Nicole. Great, so that was just a, just a simple demonstration of uh, how we can use graphs in Neo4j to combine data from different, uh, different silos and query across them to generate uh, personalized recommendations for users using both this collaborative filtering and, and content-based approaches. If you're interested in uh, learning more about, I guess, more of the, the data science -y aspects of uh, recommendations with Neo4j or want to learn more with, with Cypher or uh, a larger data set, uh, we've created the Neo4j Sandbox. Uh, with Neo4j Sandbox, you can uh, spin up a Neo4j instance uh, that's hosted uh, in the cloud. Uh, it comes with a data set already loaded uh, and lots of interesting queries to, to sort of guide you through the process. So, just go to neo4jsandbox.com. Uh, I'm going to just log in with, uh, with Twitter here, and it'll present me with these different uh, sandbox use cases that I can spin up. And, and there are a lot of things here uh, besides just a, a recommendations specific, uh, specific use case. We, uh, we can pull in data from our, our Twitter network, data about Congress, um, lots of other, other interesting data sets. Um, and once we start this in the OPJ browser, again, we can see we have um, sort of this, this guided information. And this gets into a lot more um, sort of complex approaches, a lot more in-depth on collaborative filtering and, and, and content-based filtering. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, I would, uh, would certainly recommend uh, you to check that out. And so with that, we're going to switch back to, uh, back to Alessandro. Thank you uh, so much for that, Will. Uh, yeah, so just to sum up uh, why uh, companies choose to go with graphs when they build the recommendation engines, uh, I think for all of the use cases where graph databases are a great fit, uh, I think recommendations is one of the easiest use cases to find an almost instant value in. And the reason why companies build the recommendations is solutions uh, based on graphs uh, are, of course, to increase revenue. Uh, because the more relevance you can build into your recommendation, it's, it almost immediately shows um, in, in, uh, in, in higher sales. Uh, 
uh, it uh, um, when it comes to recommendations, uh, great, good recommendations create higher engagement. Uh, and these are also data sets that are very valuable in terms of mitigating risk. From a, a performance point of view, the reason why companies choose uh, graph databases to build recommendation engines is, of course, for the real-time capabilities, the ability to uh, use the most recent transaction data, and the flexibility to, incorp new, to incorporate new data sources and uh, traverse uh, uh, through different silos. And uh, today, at Neo4j, we work with some of the largest retailers in the world uh, that all rely on Neo4j for various type of recommendation and personalization engines. So I thought we'd quickly uh, double-click on some of these case studies. So for example, Walmart uses Neo4j to quickly query customers past purchases, as well as instantly capture any new interest shown in the customer's current online visits, it's a very, which is a very complicated thing to achieve. Uh, and it's an essential task for making real-time recommendations. And with Neo4j, Walmart could substitute a heavy batch process that they used earlier with a simple real-time graph database queries, which save them both time and money from a purely productivity point of view, but more importantly, it's, it, it has laid the foundation for a better customer ex experience going forward. Adidas is another customer of Neo4j, and Adidas uses Neo4j to combine content and product data into a single searchable graph database, which is used to create personalized customer experience. And the challenge for Adidas was that data was stored and managed in disparate silos, preventing Adidas from getting an holistic view of a customer. And with a vast global audience, the Adidas group significantly improved their ability to provide a more personalized experience to its online, online shoppers. And the solution for Adidas, who was relying heavily on a polyglot persistent architecture, has created a metadata repository that stores and queries data relationships in Neo4j without having to replace existing data sources. Another customer is eBay that is now using Neo4j's graph database platform to redefine e-commerce by making delivery of online and mobile orders quick and convenient through effective routing recommendations. Uh, eBay ran into trouble with their existing MySQL solution where the joins being used created a code base that, simply put, was too slow and complex to maintain. Uh, the switch to a Neo4j solution was literally thousands of times faster than their prior MySQL solution uh, with queries that require 100 to 10 to 100 times less code. And uh, finally, uh, Neo4j is used by another top-tier US retailer to revolutionize and reinvent its real-time promotions engine. And uh, this particular retailer suffered significant revenue loss due to legacy infrastructures that required them to form on online virtual checkout queues. Uh, and you can think of this, you can think of it like the online equivalent of waiting in line, basically, uh, in order to handle volumes during peak shopping occasions such as Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday. And last year, uh, or the Cyber Monday 2016, a few months ago, this retailer saw an all-time high in online revenues due to the Neo4j-based solutions. Uh, Neo4j also enabled the company to be one of the first retailers to provide the same promotions across both online and traditional retail channels. And this is an interesting use case because on, on an average, Neo4j processes over 90% of this retailer's 35 million plus daily transactions, each between 3 and 22 hops in complexity and depth uh, in 4 milliseconds or less. So, from our perspective, graphs really are everywhere in the real retail recommendation space. It's definitely a top graph use case, and as we like to put it, we're, we're really seeing the world moving towards graph inevitability. And uh, we get support for this claim from the analysts as well. Uh, Gartner talks about graphs being 
the, uh, uh, the single most effective competitive differentiator for data-driven operations today. And they predict that by the end of 2018, 70% of leading organizations will have at least one or more pilot or proof of concept on the way. Forrester goes so far as to say that 25% of enterprises will be using graph databases this year even. And that's, that was all we had for this webinar. Uh, but before we end the session, I also want to give a shout out for some valuable resources for those of you who want to explore more on your own. Uh, if you're a developer or a data scientist uh, or cu and uh, curious to play around a little bit more with Neo4j, uh, please visit the sandbox that Will pointed to, referred to earlier, uh, at neo4jsandbox.com. If you're interested in case studies and solutions, there's a lot more interesting use cases material and case studies at our solutions webpage for retail, which you find on neo4j.com slash industry slash retail. And if you want to learn more about the product, download Neo4j, please visit our product page at neo4j.com slash product. 